All right. Before we stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, a um, little background. We've been going through the, the book of Matthew, and uh, we've covered the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, for me, this has been one of the most exciting ventures through the book of Matthew. I've taught it many times, but my eyes have been opened to so many things recently that have just blessed me beyond measure. And today is one in particular that I'm thoroughly excited about. It almost seems like an obscure passage. It almost seems brutal and, and cruel, uh, and, and it is, uh, but there is such a powerful lesson for us, especially today, July 2nd, as we're two days away from celebrating uh, our 241st birthday uh, of the finest nation in the history of the world in the United States of America. And yeah, all right, a couple of people are excited. Yeah. American exceptionalism, yeah. yeah. This side, this side's just not sure. This, <laughs> so um, you're going to see in this passage of scripture government in a very profound way and we're going to take a look at it so you'll understand the great gift you've been given especially in this passage and I didn't I, I didn't orchestrate this <clears throat> to fall on this day it, this is I, I believe with all my heart the Lord's doing and so please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord you're going to hear the passage and go, how's he going to tie this in to communion and the 4th of July? <laughs> Stay with me. <laughs> Matthew chapter 14, verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. And therefore, these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, it is not lawful. And by the way, when it says John said to him in the Greek, he continued to say, he didn't just say it once. He was outspoken. He was in the streets. He was confronting the civic authority. And so John continued to say to him, it is not lawful for you to have her, although and although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, and we're celebrating 241st birthday of the United States, so you see the tie-in? <laughs> <laughs> well, when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Now, <clears throat> Herodias' daughter is named Salome, and we don't get that from scripture, that's from Josephus. Uh, he's a, he's a, a, a historian, a Jewish historian, and uh, he's the one who gave us the name of Herodias' daughter. So Salome, and she's about 14 to 16 years of age, and she's, she dances seductively for Herod. Verse uh, 7, therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother, and then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it, and went and told Jesus. Now I want to read you just a couple other verses. You don't have to turn there. This is out of Proverbs 14, 34. It says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 29, 2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked man rules, the people groan. We could also add, and are beheaded. <laughs> and then, um, this is out of Deuteronomy chapter four. And you're thinking, why is he making a stand so long? Quit whining, I stand the whole time. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter four, now O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord, uh, the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? 
for whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all the law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourselves and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. Lord, bless our time in your word and open our eyes. Cause us to come alive to your living word, we pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of this nation, 241 years, where we have lived under um, an authority that declares that we have been created in the image of God <clears throat> and that these rights that are inalienable have been given to us by our creator and that we've acknowledged you from our birth certificate all 241 years. Now, Lord, we're waning and our children have forgotten and our grandchildren have forgotten as we have forgotten. And so, Lord, I pray as you have done so many times in the past that you would revive our hearts to your commands, that we once again would become people after your own heart and that we would be made alive. And so, Lord, please bless this nation. Let the days ahead be filled with righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please be seated. So Jesus had accomplished uh, amazing miracles as we've studied in the first 13 chapters of Matthew. People were surrounding him in droves. His teachings are phenomenal. Um, it is transforming the culture. Uh, people's eyes are being opened. Everything is being re-examined under the light of, of the blessing of this gospel as the word has been made flesh and dwelt with man. And as Jesus is speaking, it's transforming the community in which uh, he is teaching. And the word is spreading and his followers are increasing. Even John the Baptist uh, said that I must decrease that he might increase. And even John the Baptist's disciples are coming towards Christ. And Christ is growing in notoriety and strength. And it's threatening the establishment. It's threatening the, the government. It's threatening Rome. It's threatening the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those that would run Israel and their government system. And uh, it's, it's becoming quite concerning to those in positions of authority as this upstart is transforming the, the, the culture. And all of a sudden their eyes are being opened to the freedoms of man. Their eyes are being opened to what God requires of man. And as it says in the, in the book of Acts, uh, with the, the disciples, they turn the world, as we studied before, they turn the world upside down. And really they're turning it right side up. And they're, they're seeing that our accountability to God and our relationship with God affects everything else. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as we saw in Matthew chapter 5 with, with the Lord's prayer. And we also see in Genesis 1, that he commands that we've been created in, in the image of God. Let us create man in our image. And then it goes on to say that they would have dominion over the earth. And then you see in the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we see in Deuteronomy 4, which we just read that these precepts and these commands are to affect the entirety of the earth, not only in our personal relationship with God, but in the communities in which we reside and live, that we're contending for truth and we're contending for these things. Well, this comes face to face with an opposing uh, mindset and an opposing ideology. And, and these, these loggerheads meet. <clears throat> well, Jesus's kingdom is a kingdom of peace. He never, never saw him carry a sword, although he doesn't reject the sword as we would see in Romans. And we also see that Jesus said um, that, that uh, um, uh, you know, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword and turn father against brother, mother against daughter, you know. And, and, and the idea is this ideology will bring contention and there will be division because you're going to have a war for the hearts of men. And so it's, it's coming to a peak right here. And Herod the Tetrarch, is the man who's on the scene at this moment. And Herod the Tetrarch is looking at John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is somebody that he had beheaded earlier on. And when he hears about Jesus, he, he's having this, these thoughts and these dreams that this has to be the spirit of John the Baptist returning to haunt me. And, and as he's thinking about this, John the Baptist was coming in the spirit of Elijah that he made straight the way of the Lord. And he called people under repentance out in the wilderness. And then when Jesus appeared on the scene, uh, Jesus said, you know, baptize me. And he said, I, I'm not fit to untie your sandals. And he says, let it be so that all righteousness would be fulfilled. And as Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, the spirit of the Lord descends upon him in the form of a dove, says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And, and there the ministry is, is transferred 
People have repented, the spirit of the Lord has fallen. The law has been reinstated by John the Baptist who came preaching repentance to the commandments of God. This this grace and mercy comes upon mankind because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This sinless lamb of God baptized in the Jordan. And when we go back in November 6th to the 16th, we'll not only be baptized in the Jordan for some of you, but we'll have even an opportunity to go to the original site which is way out in the wilderness and it's, it's out in the middle of the desert. And we'll get a chance to see that exact location. And as this takes place, John the Baptist is then put in prison, not because he baptized Jesus, not because he made straight the way of the Lord. He's put into prison because he had the audacity to tell the civic leaders that they had to be moral. <laughs> what, a what a concept. Some of you aren't giggling. But, but wouldn't that make a world of difference if our civic leaders had a conviction before God to honor his commandments? That there was a moral standard that they adhered to? That there was a set of laws that all of us could count on and be accountable to? That there was a higher authority that governed man? That it wasn't just their whim and their will to accomplish these things? And so he has the audacity to turn and say to Herodias, which is Herod's wife, and and he says to her her, and to Herod himself, this is unlawful. Herodias belongs to Philip, your brother. Now this is even, this this is crazy. They put the the fun and dysfunction in in Herod's family. Herod, the one who killed all the babies when Jesus was born, was the father of all of them. And then when he died, he had many sons, although before he died, he had one of them executed. Uh, and then he had two others executed, and the remaining brothers, that's the Tetrarch, it's given his kingdom was split into four capacities. One of the living brothers ended up in Rome, that was Philip, and he didn't have authority over any of the regions, but, but Herod the Tetrarch here, I think it's Herod Antipas, he is the one that is ruling in the region where, where Jesus is, and so is John the Baptist, and, and his brother Philip is in Rome. Well, Philip was married to Herodias. Now, Herodias, interesting name. How is her name Herodias? And she's going to be married to Herod. And then not only Herod, but Herod's father, Herod. Well, it's because Herodias, this is an Arkansas, uh, Herodias, Herodias is, Herodias is, is married to Philip, who is Herod's son. And Herodias is Philip's niece. She's married to her uncle. Woo! <laughs> uncle Daddy. Yep, bizarre. And, and, and she, she leaves her uncle that she's married to to hook up with her other uncle, Herod the Tetrarch. Yeah, yeah. So, woohoo! This is remarkable. And, and Herodias realizes, and she's, she's young, obviously, she's the niece, so the uncles are older, and she's beautiful, and, and, and um, uh, history declares that. She's stunning. And, and she, she is, she's working it. She wants to rise. She wants her stock to rise. And she realizes Philip has no authority over anything in Rome. I mean, he has a government office, but he, he, he's, he doesn't have any authority. But if she hooks up with Herod Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, she's going to be a queen over this portion of Judea. And she's thinking, my stock will rise. I'm switching uncles. <laughs> and so she hooks up with the uncle, the other uncle, and John the Baptist just goes, this is nuts. Is, is, is there nobody who realizes this? You're ruling over our area where we declare God's law to be sovereign and, and, and his standards to be that which causes a nation to, to flourish. And you're imposing your immorality upon the nation. And this is not acceptable. It is fornication. It is adultery. It's, it's incest in many capacities. This is just plain wrong. Herodias, who is committed to accomplishing things in life, no matter what it takes, is upset. And by her, her will and her force, she wants him dead. Don't you dare call me a sinner. I, I, who are you to impose your religious beliefs on me? 
Lord of all. We sang that, didn't we? Let your name be lifted high, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes? Yes. Genesis 126, dominion over all the earth, yes? yes? And so he stands upon the precepts of God. And what does he get? He gets his head taken from his body. He's actually imprisoned, and we remember that when he was in prison, he had sent his disciples to Jesus because he was in depression. And he's thinking, I- I've done everything God's asked me to do, and I'm in prison. And he sends his disciples to go find Christ, and, and, and they said, are you the Messiah? And Jesus tells him that the, the blind see and the lame walk and the deaf hear. Go tell him. And as they turn to walk away, Jesus, when they're out of earshot, and they can't hear anymore, he turns to the multitude and he said, of men born of women, there's none greater than John the Baptist. But let no man be offended on my account. Meaning, Herod, excuse me, John the Baptist is struggling in prison. And, and his disciples don't even make it back in time before this party occurs, this birthday party occurs. And John's down there in prison praying, God, save me, help me, help me, help me. And they drag him up the stairs as he heard the footsteps coming down. He's thinking maybe this is the deliverance of the Lord. And all he sees are these these guards coming down, manhandling him in the chains. They bring him up. They put his head on on the the wooden stump. And down comes the, the axe and his head rolls. And as he exhales his last breath on earth, inhales his first breath in heaven, he realizes, God, you are Lord of all that this story would be declared even in Thousand Oaks, California on July 2nd, 2017, that for a man to stand for the sake of righteousness is always a worthy cause. And to call governments into accountability before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is always the right thing. And I I think to myself, for all of you who have issues with God and you have questions for him when you get to heaven, I remember Don McClure talking about, God, why have you taken my eye that I'm blind in one eye? And you've taken the lower lobe of my lung and my my sciatica and, and you're taking me piece by piece. Why must I suffer such? And Don pointed out, as, as Paul the Apostle said in, in Acts, none of these things move me. I don't count my life dear to myself. And, and that was Don's life verse. And then all of a sudden he's realizing God's not taking his life all at once. He's taking it piece by piece. And as, as Don made the comment that when I get to heaven and I have these questions for God, why, why did you make me walk the earth blind in my right eye? Why did you make my, my lung you know, diminished? Why, why have you done this? And, 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 and you can just imagine Peter, the apostle, there at the gates. <clears throat> Don said, you know, you ask this question. He says, oh, you have questions for God. Over to this room. And as you get there, there's Isaiah and John the Baptist. Isaiah was cut asunder. He was cut in half. John the Baptist's head was beheaded. So there's John holding his head. There's Isaiah, you know, beside himself. <laughs> and and, and you, you just see John holding his head going, what's your problem, Don? <laughs> well, I lost... My, nah, never mind, you know, it's like. <laughs> Martyrdom is such that, that you watch the, the seeds of truth spread. And, and persecution is to the church what wind is to the seed. It, it spreads the gospel. Now, we don't want conflict and we don't want trial. But you've signed up. Your life is not your own. You've been purchased with the blood of Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me, the Apostle Paul said. And that's the call to all Christians. We're called to to declare the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so as Salome dances before Herod on his birthday, Herodias knows that when he gets drunk, he gives things away. And at the exact time and the opportune time when he is just smitten with you and all these these men and your, your great uncle is Googling at you, and they're looking at your seductive dance you, you, from age 14 to possibly 16, and, and she's dressed seductively, she's dancing seductively, captures the attention of all these just perverted elderly men. And then he says in that drunken stupor, whatever you want up to half my kingdom. She says, Mom, and, and Herodias had whispered to her earlier, this is what's going to happen. He's going to drink. He's going to get drunk. You're going to dance. He's going to be moved. Everyone's going to be moved. He is a man of pride. And, and pride never understands it's prideful. You can't confront a prideful person and say, you're prideful. They'll go, no, 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 you're the prideful one. They, they always, you know, push it to you because they can't see it. 
Because pride. Pride is the original sin of all mankind. I will be like the most high, Satan said. Questioning God's word. My word has authority over your word. And man wants to, to have dominion apart from God, even though we're on his earth, breathing his air, drinking his water. And in pride, Herod couldn't see it. And, and he's concerned with all of the, the thoughts of the people that he's surrounded with in the room. And, and when Salome you know, dances and he's moved and everyone's laughing and the room is filled and cigar smoke and, and the drink is being passed and it's just this, this bevy of, of you know, sensuality, he says, what do you want? And Herodias had whispered in her ear earlier and she says to her great uncle, I, I want the head of John the Baptist in a platter. <laughs> and, and, and as the passage picks up, he did fear the multitude. It was his birthday and he promised to give an oath to her, whatever she might ask. And here's a man that has murdered thousands of people. This is a man that has killed his own family members. This is a man who's stolen his brother's wife. This is a man who has no moral standard whatsoever, but he's gonna keep his word. Not because he's a man who believes that he needs to keep his word, but because he's more concerned with those in the room than he is with his heart before God and doing what's right. Because power to him is pride. Pride is authority. Pride is his ability to push his will. And he can't lose all of the favors they're looking at him. Because he's made a macho statement. And it's just John the Baptist anyways. I mean, what's his life matter? And the king was sorry, verse 9. He, he did have a season of conviction. And the reason why is because he was the young one who was sent away to Rome when his father was uh, uh, horrific. And, he, and he, did, he did get raised with some conviction, but that was lost in the ruling of the kingdom his father once had. But because of the oaths and those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. And so he sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And it was brought on a, on a platter, and, and the King James says a charger, not like a car, but it was, it was this idea that had a lid on it. And it was given to the girl, and she brings it over to her mother. And her mother, probably with, you know, great pomp and circumstance, lifts the lid. And you can just hear a moan in the room with this, this head with entrails, just, just graphic. And that, that's a happy Mother's Day. And the room just gasps. Some of them, yeah! And, and not knowing, but everyone somehow is affected by this. And, and you, anyone who's ever served in combat or in, in, in you know, police work, firefighters, first responders who have seen dead bodies, who have seen graphic images, uh, I, I've had limited exposure and I, I know the effects it has. I... I I remember throwing the ball with my son. I'd been a, a sheriff's chaplain. I, you know, responded to suicides, and I remember seeing a man hanging, another man who had shot himself, and you know, I'm helping clean up, and I, I've seen these things, taking loved ones to go see their, the, the bodies of, of the deceased, and those images. I remember throwing the ball with my son, and, and he, him saying, Dad, throw the ball. Dad, throw the ball. And I had to kind of collect my thoughts, and I realized I, uh, these images had come rushing in, and I had to just kind of put them back in the file cabinet and close it. And, and I'm not somebody who served in combat, I haven't, but, but that hit me. I and mean, imagine our veterans, as, as we saw our president yesterday honoring our veterans, the images that they have to carry holding the line and defending freedom. We talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and, and it's, it's, it's tough. And as that, that lid is lifted from the charger, from the platter, Everyone in the room, you can't get that image out of your head. It's, it's stuck. It's stuck. This is real. And, and in the room was, was Pilate and Pilate's wife. It was a party. They were all there. Pilate and Pilate's wife were there. Pilate's wife later would just say, we can't do this to this man, meaning Jesus. I, I, I've been haunted in my dreams. Pilate even struggled over turning him over to Herod's men. Herod's men beat the daylights out of him. And this would happen later in chapter 26 of Matthew. And everyone's been affected by this visual as it's, it's seared into their mind as Herodias lifts the lid off the platter and almost with, with satisfaction. Like, this is what happens when you confront me. 
I will, I will force my hand. I am rising in power. I, I, she, was, she was the true feminist of her day. She was the neck that turned the head. She ran the kingdom. She got what she wanted. And there, Herod, even though he had had an inkling of moral conviction, he still yielded. And she knew how to play him like a fiddle. And then the disciples, the remaining disciples of John, just come and take the headless body of John and the head. And they go and they tell Jesus after they've buried him. And this is that picture. And what you have is conflicting government. Conflicting government. There's three types of rule in humanity. Many of us are unaware of that. There's the rule of autonomy. Autonomy is derived from two Greek words, autos meaning self, and nomos meaning law, self-law. Autonomy. I want autonomy. Every teenager, I want autonomy. I want to be in charge. I want self-rule. <laughs> we struggle with that. I want to be my own person. I don't, I don't, why, I don't like your rules. Autonomy. Now, autonomy is not a bad thing. It means simply self-law. The law is not outside of us, but inside our true being. So whatever fills you is what governs you. Let me repeat that. Whatever fills you is what governs you. Because that's the identity of who you are. You're a trichotomy, a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. If the spirit of the Lord is in you, then that's what governs you. If the spirit of the Lord isn't in you, then you have the body and you have the intellect. And, and the intellect is limited in that you have no proper reasoning because the logos in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt with man. And he, he, he created all things by the power of his logos, his word. And so his word is what governs, his word is what creates, his word is what is formed. And so there's natural law we're governed by that God spoke into existence that, that you, you, you throw something up and it drops. That's the law of gravity. The logos established that. There's natural laws that govern man. The sun rises, the sun sets. The earth spins, the seasons come, the seasons go. The snow falls, the rain fills the reservoirs. The crops grow, they're harvested. We, we can bank on it. A child is born, logos, the word of God governing. The cells, each intricately, they're, they're not, they're, they're not uh, the, the, each one has, has DNA imposed, information imposed. For example, this is, this is, this is physical. It's just, it's just paper. It's from a tree. It's, it's pulp. But on it is metaphysical. It's ideas. They're words that, that I'm speaking to you through the air. It's going into your mind. It's creating a transformation that, that you're being renewed by the transforming of your mind. This is metaphysical. This, this, this is information. It's imprinted. Metaphysical means that there's something that is true and there's something that is false. If you remove this idea of a, of a moral governor, then you're left to just absolute insanity and it breaks down and you create whatever it is you want to create, but, but you're not creating out of nothing. You're forming out of substance that God has placed, but you're, 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 you're dismissing him and his authority. And this autonomous rule, this autonomy, is, is whatever's in you is what governs you. Whatever is in you is what governs you. Autonomy is a man living according to his own rational nature. It should be that the autonomous man follows a universal law of reason. Have you ever heard that comment? You can't reason with him. I was talking to a, a brother in the Lord who was working on a project over at our new place and and he said his son was going to go to this school and this school because he, he loves to join liberal organizations so he can contend with them. And he said, but we didn't want him to go to any of these schools because his, the father's comment was, son, when you get to that level, there's no reasoning. They just shout you down. We're not here to find the truth. We just want you to shut up. And if you don't, we'll behead you. Antifa. Anti-fascist, but they act as fascists. And they silence you. 
I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. Be quiet. And this, whatever's in you is what rules you. The man follows the law of reason is not in itself a negative feature. It can be positive if, if it's the Lord who fills you. Autonomy, in autonomy, one follows the natural law of God implanted in our own being by receiving the Lord. But the problem of autonomy is not dependence on reason, but the divorce of reason from the moral and religious dimension. You take God out of the equation, you are an abyss. You have no reason nor a desire to reason. You just want your will, no matter what it costs. And you'll surround your people with those who agree with you and kill anyone who doesn't. You don't, you don't want to come let us reason together. You don't want to do that. Reason is irrelevant. Reason means that you're looking at the laws of nature. Reason means it, 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 that this is, you know, as, as we saw the picture of, of uh, the, the biological female taking male hormones and then the self-professing biological male who c said he was gay and, and, and they're, they're married and, and, and pregnant. But the, the biological female had to stop taking male hormones in order to become pregnant, and the professing biological male homosexual had to give up homosexuality in order to have sex with the female who was professing to be a male. Do you remember that? I mean, it's hard to explain. And you look at that and you say, natural law. But if, if you contend with that, creating the image of God and the purpose of it, if you contend with that, you're shouted down. There's no reasoning. They, they, they were both lying. You're not a male. You, the only way to get pregnant is to stop taking male hormones. A, a, a male will never have a baby. Ever, ever, never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever. It's, it's metaphysically imprinted in DNA. Now, granted, we're all warped and we all have struggles, no doubt. And, and this is a byproduct of a culture that has moved away and they're struggling and I get that. And the church has lost a great opportunity to minister because we've been so absent of self conviction that we would rather project on something that we can physically see and, and decry instead of repent of our own struggles. Do you know the reason why this is here and, and why it's facing us? We created the monster, 1967 excuse me, 1969, and put in law in 1970, the, the divorce ruling by Ronald Reagan. No fault divorce, California, first in the, in the country. And marriages have just disintegrated ever since. The divorce rate in the church is almost as high as the divorce rate in the world. And then when the father's out of the home and the mother's out of the home and, and the children are trying to associate and connect with and get their image and, and imprint and understand how life is supposed to work and the structure of the family is laid out in Ephesians 5 and 6 and the children are all, and they grow up struggling and we don't go to church anymore because we're dual income and, and we, we don't have time. It's the only day to rest and we really don't want to go to church and, and you know, we got to get our kids and, and, it's all outside and life is hectic and chaotic and the kids are warped. And we look at this and we go, ah, oh, this is awful as we're moving from one relationship to the next, filling our minds with pornography and engaging in, in the things of the world, not participating in, in, in legislative process to establish a community where, where this can be blessed. As we look at what is, what is, again, the law, wise restraints that make men free, the pursuit of excellence. And we, we've rejected that, moved away from it as a culture since the 40s. And so we see this autonomy. What you're filled with is what governs you. When divorced from the divine ground of being, autonomy becomes nothing more than an empty critical thought. I'm just critical, and I'm empty of, of any reason. And it degenerates into mere humanism and becomes a situation which cuts itself off from the transcendent source of life, which is the Lord. And we don't need God. Who is God that he should have authority over me? And humanism void of anything spiritual, anything connected with, with God's divine law and his governing of the world. And then we look at this and we say it's acceptable. And then comes theonomy. 
we've studied this, theos meaning God, nomos meaning law, God's law, applied theonomy. It comes from those two Greek words. Theonomy does not mean the law of God revealed to man in the Bible, but rather theonomy is the autonomy that is aware of God's presence in your life. It's not simply the written word of God, but it's a revealed law of nature, as we see in the Declaration of Independence of uh, the law of nature and nature's God. I think that's the Constitution, of the law of nature and nature's God. This means that theonomy is the realization that divine being is the ground of man's being and therefore the law of reason that governs man cannot be separated from religion. That's why John Adams said only a moral people can have a republic. You remove that, you have no moral ground and there will be no freedom. There'll be no autonomy, no self-rule because what fills you is what rules you. And if there's no morality, then you're subject to humanism, which is I'm going to enact my will on you as opposed to the will of God, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so autonomy and theonomy belong together. They must belong together. Theonomy is the form and man's rational nature is the substance. Autonomy is a necessity for theonomy. But when autonomy cuts itself off from the mystery of, of, of this, this human being creating the image of God and you remove God from the equation, when it cuts itself off, it becomes a proud humanism that sets itself against theonomy and God's rule. And so what do we have in our country today? We want to remove the First Amendment. We want to shut down religious liberty. We want God removed from the edifices of our buildings why were they there to begin with? When you remove something that's been there for hundreds of years, you might ask why it was put there to begin with before you remove it. And then you have heteronomy. And this is the final one, heteronomy. This is where we are today, heteronomy. It comes from two Greek words, heteros, another or different kind. Heteros, another or different kind. And nomos, meaning law. Heteronomy signifies law that is foreign to man's nature and being. It is law that go, goes against the will of God and has created goodness. I want his head on a platter. Show me in the scriptures where God condones that. Heteronomy imposes an alien law, religious or secular. You can have religions that are a violation of the third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, where you do despicable acts of evil in the name of God. That is a violation of the third commandment. Alu Akbar. It imposes alien law, religious or secular, on a man's mind. It disregards the logos, the, the spoken word of God, the structure of the mind and the world. That's where we get university. It's, it's from Elohim, which is in Genesis 1. It's singular plurality or unified diversity, university. Diverse study for a unified purpose of glorifying God and understanding his creation. We remove God from that and it's just heteronomy. It destroys the honesty of truth and the dignity of moral personality. Heteronomy, it undermines creative freedom and the humanity of man. Its symbol is terror exercised by absolute church or absolute states. Sharia law. The, 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 the Inquisition. The religious wars in Ireland. Christianity has been subject to that when it's been warped and the sword's been in the hand of the church. God never intended the church to hold the sword, but hold the soul. And when the church, and, and this is, this is sure, fundamental Islam is a government disguised as a religion. Humanism is a religion disguised as a government. And that's why the two fit. That's why they'll, you'll fight for Sharia understanding before you allow the Bible to be taught in schools. Heteronomous law involves willfulness and arbitrariness, ignores and destroys all creativity in man and stifles the expression of man's reason. 
You'll do what you're told and like it. And if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. And if you have the audacity to speak back to me, I will remove your head from your body. Heteronomy means coercion, authoritarianism, and enslavement. There's an elite class to rule. And we're the ones with the intellect. We're the Nietzsche class that have risen above the, the emptiness of the universe. And we exact our will on you. We don't want to see you improve. You serve me. Heteronomy. It's contrary to both autonomy and theonomy. Heteronomy comes because autonomy, what you're filled with is what you're ruled by. And if it's not God, it ends up in heteronomy. If it's ruled by God, it ends up in theonomy. Heteronomy rejects the courage of autonomy and divine law awareness of theonomy and seeks to escape danger by subjection to an authority that will give it security. And as Benjamin Franklin said, anyone who gives up their liberty for the sake of security deserves neither. We're going to give up that freedom because we'll be safe. Safe. Fear is the driving force between, um, behind the acceptance of heteronomy. The more we can scare you, and we, we let every good critical event is an opportunity to increase the size of government and reduce the autonomy of man. You've been given a government that's given you autonomy because you have been given a government that says you've been created in the image of God and that these rights are inalienable. And I've asked you before, how many rights does the U.S. Constitution give you? None. It gives you a precept on how to protect the rights given to you by God. It gives you a government to protect them, but you don't, to, to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and we don't even know what's in it. God bless America. We don't even know what it is. We don't even know how to defend it. We don't even know what makes liberty and freedom, though we stand at every sports event and, and land of the free home of the brave. But we don't instruct our children or our grandchildren. We have removed it. We don't engage. There is no theonomy in our culture anymore. Thus, heteronomy appeals to those who are willing to surrender their liberty for the, for the security promised by a central power and to those who would control others by their own ends. We've almost lost this republic. We're in a season of mercy and grace. And God is crying out for self-governing community where men and women understand the law of God as Deuteronomy 4 says, now O Israel listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did to that idol Baal at Peor. For the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed that hetero heteronomy of that false God. For the Lord your God has destroyed those men who followed. But you held fast to the Lord your God, and you are alive today, every one of you, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it? Look, look, look what's, what you're holding it's the living, breathing word of God. And there's no gun pointed to your head and we're not meeting in secret. You can't do this in a large portion of the world today because the founders of our nation gave you that. They pledged their life and their sacred honor and their fortunes to give you what you have. 241 years. And we don't even know what's in the document they bled and died for. And the Lord God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him. 
And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all the law, which I set before you this day, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the freedom of religion, the freedom of the press, the freedom to peaceably assemble, the freedom of a right of redress of grievances against the government. Only take heed to yourselves and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. And how can you teach them something you yourself don't know? I'm limited in time, so I'll wrap it up. I'll share with you just these last two aspects. On Tuesday, we celebrate the 241st, birth, 241st birthday of the United States of America. No greater freedom in the history of the entirety of the earth. No nation has lived under one document longer than the United States of America. We, realize, we need to realize as we look back on July 4, 1776, that it was a very dis dangerous decision that each of those folks made when they signed that Declaration of Independence. John Adams, when he signed, he said, whether we live or die, sink or swim, succeed or fail, I stand behind this Declaration of Independence, and if God wills it, I am ready to die in order that this country might experience freedom. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Autonomy, whatever fills you, governs you. And if it's the enemy, then God is glorified and a nation thrives. Deuteronomy 4. It's a kind of patriotism which led men armed with little more than hunting rifles to take on the greatest empire on the face of the earth and win. And it wasn't an easy decision to go against England. And it wasn't a hasty decision. They, they contemplated it. They lived in colonies and they considered themselves to be English citizens. They felt they should enjoy the same rights and privileges that any freeborn Englishman enjoyed back in England. Their ancestors were the ones who put forward the Magna Carta to come against King John to bring the freedoms of men from the divine right of kings, which was, which was heteronomy, contrary to God's law. One man suppressing another and enslaving another. We've been creating the image of God. But over a period of a few years, King George began to ignore all of what was written in the Magna Carta, and he, he oppressed the American colonies. Oppressive taxes and regulations, they made their lives miserable. And when they complained, King George sent troops. I remember my daughter asking me a trivia question, who was the first black man to die in the Revolutionary War, and I said, Crispus Attucks. Boston Massacre, he was one of five who was killed as they stood in opposition to oppressive taxes. And the English soldiers opened fire on the colonists, and Crispus Attucks was the first to die. Fourteen months before the Declaration of Independence was written, an armed conflict broke out at Lexington and Concord that was fashioned by uh, Jonas Clark, who was a pastor of a church that mustered his, his congregants. And they stood in the fields of Lexington and Concord, and they applied theonomy. They applied the, the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. They, they, the shot heard round the world had to be fired from the British because they wouldn't respond unless fired upon. But they were prepared to defend the weak, and they did. 366 were killed or wounded that day, both on the British and the colonial side. Emboldened by what they considered a victory, the militias gathered up on Dorchester Heights and, and ended the siege of Boston by the British as Henry Knox, a bookseller in Boston, had convinced George Washington that he could get artillery from Fort Ticonderoga and brought it over in the winter with one of the greatest feats, engineering feats in the history of the world, and established them on a, on a fog-laden harbor in, in Boston, although at the top of Dorchester Heights, it was a full moon night, so they worked all night and put the artillery in its emplacements, and when the fog lifted, the British saw it, and they began the bombardment of Boston, and they evacuated the British, and based on that victory, they signed the Declaration of Independence, and after that, they lost battle after battle after battle after battle after battle, <laughs> until everything was decimated and they were wintering up at Valley Forge. Half of them had dysentery. 
They couldn't muster and the remaining half, a third of them didn't have boots and wrapped their feet in burlap sacks. It was Thomas Paine's American crisis. It was passed out by George Washington to all those that remained. These are the times that try men's soul, the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot. Motivated them, they marched the 11 miles to Trenton, took on the Hessians and turned the tide of the war on December 24th, 1776, so that the conscriptions were resumed, the war continued, and this experiment in liberty survived so that you can sit here 241 years later with your Bibles opened so that you can be filled with the Spirit of God and that he would bless this nation through theonomy. One of the greatest of all was Patrick Henry who said, give me liberty or give me death. And you read that speech that he gave before the Virginia legislature. It's, it's fascinating. It's filled with scripture. Three million people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battle alone. There is a just God who presides over the destiny of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battle for us. The battle, sir, is not, as he says, to us, but unto the Lord. Read it. And I conclude with this. July 4, 1776. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them, theonomy. Not heteronomy, theonomy. The king no longer operates in the authority of God. It was a revival, the first, second, and third great awakening that infused America. They were biblically literate. They understood that God rules in the affairs of men. They understood autonomy that you are ruled by whatever you are filled. And this theonomy was so important to them that they declared that in your birth certificate that has protected all of us for 241 years. That among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to that separation. We will reason with you according to the scriptures. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, meaning you can't put a lien on them, no one can take them, you can't give them away, that among these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, which is virtue. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men based in the Noahic covenant by God, read in Deuteronomy 4. This is why God created government, for the protection of men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Autonomy, what you're filled with is what you're ruled by. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organize its power in such form as to them seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness according to the scriptures. And then at the end of it, after they list all the grievances, reasoning with the king, they state, nor have we been wanting an attention to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow their usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence, they too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consangu consanguinity. <laughs> we must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress, assemble appealing to the Supreme Judge, both words capitalized, of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, theonomy, 
do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are of right and ought to be free and independent states and they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as a free and independent states they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, theonomy, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And for many of you, that's the first time you've ever heard that because we no longer teach our children and our grandchildren. What you're filled with is what you're ruled by. If you are filled with God, it is theonomy. If you are filled with your self-will, it becomes heteronomy and the destruction of man. One brings freedom, the other brings slavery. Choose this day whom you will serve. But we have been given a great gift, land of the free and home of the brave. God bless America. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this picture of a man who is filled with the spirit of the Lord would contend with those who are filled with the spirit of the flesh. And Lord, we know that this idea of autonomy, what we're filled with is what we're ruled by. And Lord Jesus, you said in your word that you've come to set men free. And that freedom comes when we realize in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. And you said, I've come to set the captives free. I've come to sanctify and justify you. Justify just as if I'd never sinned. I'm going to cover your sin, past, present, and future by my body that is broken and my blood that is shed as a sacrifice for blood must be shed for the remission of sin. And I will set you right with me, God says, that I may rule you. I will purchase you with my blood. And then the sanctification that we set ourselves apart, that we're ruled, theonomy, by the law of God, not to be saved, but because we are saved, that we would affect a nation and a world by this freedom we have received ourselves. And so God, today communion before our nation's 241st birthday is a communion of autonomy and theonomy. We are coming to be filled by the Spirit of God that we would be ruled by the law of God for the freedom of man. And Lord, we know that the law is not the absence of restraint, but the application of restraint for the purpose of excellence. And so God, as we examine our lives at your throne of grace as we come to take communion, Lord, let us ourselves be governed that our nation would be the same, governed by you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd bless this time of communion and you'd touch your people and fill us with your spirit and use us for your glory that thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven would happen. Help us, Lord. Bless this time. Be glorified, Jesus, as we lift you up. For you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and we love you. And we worship you this day in Jesus' name. Amen.